So I'm going to lead in with an introduction to vernal pool ecology and wildlife. And I know many of you are familiar with these habitats and these critters, but I want to set the stage for why vernal pools are so special and the and you know what are the wildlife that we are trying to to help when we restore them. So the basic definition of a vernal pool is uh, it's a temporary body of water that typically holds water from fall through the spring, but they experience a low water or dry phase in the summer. They are primarily found in forested settings and are characterized by small size, shallow depth, and they have no permanent inflow or outflow of water. They support specialist animals that are specially adapted to utilize them, but importantly, you will not find permanent populations of fish in vernal pools. The dry period eliminates fish, which are a dominant predator in permanent aquatic habitats. So where might you find vernal pools? Well, they form in a variety of places. Their position in the landscape can suggest uh, their origin. A few common places to find vernal pools in Pennsylvania include floodplains, poor, poorly drained valley bottoms and lowlands, uh, the glaciated regions in the northeast and the northwest corners of the state, periglacial regions, and the Ridge and Valley Physiographic Province. Vernal pools in Pennsylvania range from little leafy puddles that you can jump across to really large wetlands where you can easily fill your hip waders. These photos illustrate some different types of vernal pools that you might encounter in Pennsylvania. Hydroperiod is a term that includes the length of time and the time of year that a wetland holds water. And it's a really important concept for vernal pools. Vernal pools have a seasonally fluctuating hydroperiod with higher water levels in the fall, winter, and spring, and a period of low water or dry conditions by late summer. These photos show two pools in their wet and dry phases. The top two photos show a little unvegetated pool in Michaud State Forest, and the bottom two show photos show a very large semi-permanent pool located near State College. And now we'll look at the unique wildlife that make vernal pools so special. We'll start with the vernal pool indicators. When you find these animals in a wetland in the spring, it indicates that the pool likely has a seasonally fluctuating hydroperiod. Vernal pool indicator species have special adaptations to utilize vernal pools in spite of the dry phase. And they just don't do as well in permanent ponds and wetlands that have fish because their young are not well adapted to avoiding predation by fish. 
Now in Pennsylvania, we have four species of salamanders and two species of frogs that are vernal pool specialists. They take advantage of vernal pools in a similar way. The adults live in the forest surrounding vernal pool wetlands. Each spring, the adults leave their safe nooks and crannies and migrate to a vernal pool, usually the one where they were born, uh, to find a mate and lay eggs. The eggs hatch and the aquatic young develop in the pool over a period of months. As the pool warms and dries down in the summer, the young metamorphose into terrestrial living juveniles that must leave the pool before it dries. Both the juveniles and the adults spend the rest of the year living in the upland forest. So I call these migratory vernal pool amphibians, moving to and from the vernal pool wetlands. Our four vernal pool indicator salamanders are in a special group called the mole salamanders. There are large amphibians that spend most of the year in underground burrows in the forest surrounding a vernal pool. This chunky black and white fellow is a marbled salamander. They are unique among the mole salamanders in that the males and females rendezvous in dry pool basins in early fall. The female lays her eggs and often guards them until the pool floods with the fall rains. Because of this early start, the eggs hatch long before the other mole salamanders arrive in the spring, and marbled salamander larvae have more time to grow and are among the first of the young amphibians to leave the pool the following summer. Note that all of our mole salamanders have, as larvae, have frilly external gills, which are visible in the picture of the marbled salamander larvae in the top right. Jefferson salamanders are, are the first mole salamanders to migrate to a pool in the spring, often crossing snow and ice. The blue spotted salamander is very uncommon in Pennsylvania and is only known from a few counties. It looks similar to the Jefferson salamander and can hybridize with them. The spotted salamander is a hefty mole salamander growing up to 10 inches long. It is immediately recognizable by its bright yellow spots. It is the most commonly encountered mole salamander in Pennsylvania vernal pools. Its large, firm, clear, or cloudy white egg masses are easily spotted in a pool basin. Females often lay their egg masses in communal clusters, as shown in the picture on the left. Like the mole salamanders, wood frogs are vernal pool specialists. They spend most of the year living in the forests around vernal pools. They migrate to a vernal pool in the spring to mate and lay eggs. Females often lay their eggs in large communal rafts too, as shown in the upper left photo. The wood frog is our most commonly encountered vernal pool indicator amphibian. You might hear their distinctive quacking call coming from a vernal pool if you're out in the woods in early spring. A fun fact about wood frogs is that they just overwinter in the leaves on the ground. They become completely frozen and enter an essentially lifeless state. As temperatures start to go down in the fall, they have to begin creating this internal antifreeze that prevents their cells from bursting when they freeze. But in the spring, they gently thaw out again and their heart starts beating again. They wake up and they return to their natal vernal pool to breed. Our last vernal pool specialist amphibian is the eastern spadefoot. The spadefoot is a fossorial species, meaning it spends most of its life underground. Hard projections on its webbed hind feet work like digging spades, allowing it to tunnel into the sandy soils it prefers. It emerges sporadically after, he after heavy rainstorms to breed, and they can use very quick drying vernal pools in sandy woodlands. So I've stated several times now that vernal pool amphibians are moving to and from vernal pools throughout, throughout the year, but how do we know where they move or how far they move? Well, this wood frog had the misfortune of being captured by a research team and saddled with a radio transmitter, but he showed us how far he traveled as he moved between a vernal pool, a forested woodland, and an upland forest. This movement was necessary for him to find the best spots for breeding, feeding, and surviving the heat of summer and the cold of winter. Additional studies have shown that vernal pool amphibians commonly move between a quarter to a half of a mile away from a vernal pool after the breeding season ends. Some individuals move less, some move more to find their home territories, but both adults and the recently transformed juveniles must make this trek. 
Now, in contrast to the amphibians that move to and from the pools, there are some neat invertebrates that are always present in the pool basin in one life stage or another. I'll point to the different critters and the life cycle stages as I talk about them. I'll try to here with my pointer. Uh, two large freshwater crustaceans that specialize in vernal pools are the fairy shrimp and the clam shrimp. Many smaller crustaceans like copepods, cladocera, and um, seed shrimp or ostracods can become very abundant in vernal pools, but they're also found in other types of wetlands. In this life cycle diagram, we'll start with the eggs. The eggs are the life stage that overwinters in the pool basin. The eggs hatch when environmental conditions such as photo period and water temperature are right. The first batch of young mature quickly, reproduce, and lay more eggs. There may be several cycles from egg to adult before the pool begins to dry up. And as water temperatures um, increase and the water levels drop, in the summer, uh, the adults are triggered, that last generation of adults are triggered to lay hardy eggs. And these eggs have a tough outer coating, which allows them to withstand the summer drought and freezing temperatures of winter. So here's a quick look at our vernal pool specialist crustaceans. The springtime fairy shrimp is the most common species of fairy shrimp encountered in Pennsylvania, but several other species have been documented in the state. Male fairy shrimp at the top right have long trunks or claspers on their head, which they use to grab hold of a female. Females, shown here at bottom left, have eggs protected within a small pouch at the base of their swimmerettes. Clam shrimp are less commonly encountered than fairy shrimp. They look like a fingernail clam from the outside, but on the inside is the body of a little shrimp-like creature. Pictured here is the variable clam shrimp, but several other species have been documented in Pennsylvania. Clam shrimp are not well studied, but they seem to prefer very quick drying pools. I'm going to talk a little bit more about other kinds of wildlife that use vernal pools in a moment, but I want to pause here to talk about the importance of the uplands to vernal pool specialist species. This has implications for restoration projects because the condition of the uplands has direct impacts on the health of the vernal pools themselves. We don't have time to deep, di deep dive into all the aspects of vernal pool conservation and management in this program today, but I'd like to direct your attention to our Vernal Pools of Pennsylvania website. It contains detailed information on vernal pool ecology and wildlife, along with resources for landowners and land managers. Our Vernal Pool Conservation and Management Guide in particular contains detailed best management practices for landowners and land managers. And you can download this document as a PDF from the resources section of the Vernal Pools of Pennsylvania website. I'd like to highlight the three key habitat zones that are associated with vernal pools because they are pertinent to wetland restoration. The vernal pool basin is the area that becomes fully flooded in the spring. This is where vernal pool animals breed and lay their eggs. The young hatch, feed, develop within this vernal pool nursery. The vernal pool basin is sensitive to disturbance at any time of year, but the dry phase is the time that it is most resilient and suitable for restoration work. The vernal pool depression is protected by state and federal regulations. The vernal pool core is the upland immediately surrounding the pool. The condition of this envelope around the pool strongly influences the condition of the pool and is important for protecting water quality. Adult amphibians concentrate in the vernal pool core as they move to and from the pool during the breeding, breeding season, and it also supports really high densities of recently metamorphosed amphibians, little tiny frogs, toads, and salamanders, which are leaving the pool in the summer and the fall. Most sources recommend that a minimum of 100 feet of core upland be protected along with the vernal pool basin, but we like to recommend protecting a minimum of 200 feet, especially around high quality sites and pool clusters. And finally, the supporting upland habitat includes the core, but it extends even further out. The supporting upland habitat is where vernal pool anim animals spend most of the year seeking food, shelter, and overwintering sites. The uplands are corridors where animals move between breeding pools and their upland homes. We recommend managing a minimum of 400 feet from the pool edge as upland vernal pool habitat 
and up to 1,000 feet for high quality sites and pool clusters. Obviously, land ownership and land use factors into upland habitat management at these increasing distances from the pool basin, but generally more activities are compatible in the supporting upland, um, such as timber harvest, uh, but we should still try to strive to maintain at least 50 to 75% of that upland habitat as forest or forest mixed with other natural habitat types. So to recap, for the best protection of vernal pool wildlife, the EPA recommends managing a thousand foot radius area beyond the edge of a vernal pool basin as vernal pool upland habitat. This distance will protect 95% of a vernal pool's amphibians in the uplands where they spend most of the year. And this example here, this map image, is showing three vernal pools. They're outlined in blue in sort of the middle of those concentric circles. Uh, they have lost almost all of their natural core and upland habitat to agriculture and development. So the restoration application here is to consider the land ownership and the condition of the core and upland habitat around your potential restoration site. And you need to address the restoration needs for the adjacent, um, for that adjacent habitat in your restoration plan. If the uplands around your potential rest restoration site are severely degraded, then the site might not be a good candidate for restoration. Also consider where roads are and avoid restorations that might draw amphibians to cross roads. So now to consider our exploration of the wildlife that use vernal pools, I just wanna to quickly touch on uh, what we call the facultative species. These are animals that are commonly breed in vernal pools, but they can also reproduce successfully in permanent waters. Uh, the commonly encountered American toad, uh, the little hop toad you might find in your yard, will breed in vernal pools. The males have a steady high trilling call. And there's no need to travel to the rainforest to find uh, strange and beautiful tree frogs. You can find them right here in Pennsylvania. This is a gray tree frog, and they're very well camouflaged with skin that looks like tree bark on their backs, but they have dandelion yellow on the inside of their legs and bellies. And here's a tiny tree frog that is seldom seen but often heard, and that's the spring peeper. Full grown peepers are only about an inch and a half long and have an X on their back. And the recent metamorph shown on the left fits on the tip of a pencil. And this little video is of a male spring peeper working hard to be heard over the sound of his singing competitors. Vernipole indicators and facultative species often occur together in the same wetlands. Bigger, longer hydro period wetlands, vernal pool wetlands tend to support more kinds of facultative species. I took this video of a wetland near where I live in York County. You might have to turn up your volume a little bit to hear the wood frogs, but they are enthusiastically quacking underneath the overpowering chorus of the spring peepers. So here's another facultative species, the red spotted newt in its aquatic adult newt form on the left and its terrestrial eft form there on the right. They love to visit vernal pools in the spring to munch on the rich egg masses left there by vernal pool frogs and salamanders. There's uh, three turtles that are Pennsylvania species of greatest conservation or greatest, um, yeah, conservation concern. I'll get it right, species of greatest conservation need, there we go, that will visit vernal pools to find food and water. We have the spotted turtle at top left, which is especially dependent on vernal pools and other wetlands, the wood turtle at the top right, and the box turtle at bottom left. And there's a strong food web that supports all the reptile and amphibian life in a vernal pool. A wide variety of small insects and crustaceans make up the bulk of the biodiversity and biomass in a vernal pool, and they form all of the important functional feeding groups that make a vernal pool ecosystem work. 
Here we have the insect predators that help control the abundance of prey items, such as mosquitoes and midges. We have the shredders, like these caddisflies, the log cabin and the cigar tube examples here, based on name for the way they build their exterior cases. Uh, the shredders are important because they begin the process of releasing the energy locked up in the leaf and woody, um, woody material that accumulates in a vernal pool. And then there's many small insect larvae that create the invertebrate smorgasbord or the vernal pool soup, as I like to call it, in the spring. And they provide protein and fat rich meals that are consumed by growing salamander larvae and insect predators in their larval stage. And they feed birds and bats in their adult stages. Small vernal pool crustaceans also reach their peak abundances in the spring and nourish the food web. Characteristic vernal pool crustaceans include water fleas, illustrated at the top right, and those are females carrying eggs inside their carapace or their shell. Uh, copepods, like the, the red individual there in the bottom center, that's a male there, and on the left hand side of the screen is a female copepod with her two egg sacs that she's toting along behind her, and on bottom right is a seed shrimp. So why are vernal pools important? Well, they're essential for indicator species that depend on vernal pools for the successful development and survival of their young. In the mid-Atlantic region, 26% of all threatened and endangered amphibians depend upon vernal pools. They perform the same essential ecological services such as flood control and groundwater purification that all wetlands provide. And I think that they're a good example of a keystone habitat. They exert an oversized effect on the surrounding landscape. Without vernal pools, Pennsylvania's forest would look and function very differently, and some species would disappear altogether. So to highlight the way, you know, the significance of vernal pools beyond, you know, just the lives of the invertebrates and amphibians that develop in their waters, um, here are some images of insectivorous birds and mammals that congregate around vernal pools to feed. And I'm going to end this section with a video that really highlights how vernal pools serve as a hub for wildlife activity in a Pennsylvania forest. I just want to thank Taylor Blackman of Penn State University for providing the um, game cam images and videos that were stitched together to make this video. Mm -hmm. 